Hi, so today I am going to be presenting on the book Learning to Labor by Paul Willis. So to give a little background on the author and the book, Paul Willis is a uh, social scientist from England and most fittingly is also a professor of sociology. He did most of his uh, work uh, at the university at the university uh, level at Keele University, which is located in England. But in 2010, he actually came to America and specifically New Jersey to uh, do uh, his education work at Princeton University. So uh, Paul Willis's work within uh, so sociology it primarily emphasizes ethnog ethnographic studies of youth culture. And in a little bit, I'm actually going to elaborate on what that uh, refers to. So, uh, but uh, in the meantime, I also wanted to mention that the book Learning to Labor is actually one of the most cited works in the field of sociology when it intersects with education studies. So this is actually a pretty uh, monumental book that I am actually presenting. So moving on to some key terms, as I had previously mentioned, I wanted to discuss ethnography. That is, uh, a that is actually a qualitative study and analysis, meaning there's no quantitative data. It's all based on just observation, and your data is all going to be qualitative, meaning it's not it's not going to be numerical. It's just going to be all observational and categorical data. So, um, with that aside, ethnography is the qualitative study and analysis of customs belonging to an individual individual culture, and it's basically just your observations of said customs within that culture. Oh, I apologize. I accidentally hit uh, my enter key. But um, I, moving on, I just wanted to uh, also mention about working class, which is the socioeconomic category that includes that specifically uh, includes members who engage in industrial work and or physical labor. And typically, members of the working class are going to receive relatively low wages. And then speaking of uh, physical labor, I also wanted to differentiate between manual and mental labor, and that's pretty self-explanatory. Manual labor requires physical skills, and mental labor requires intellectual skills. Of course, they can somewhat sometimes intersect, but that is what they, that is what both types of labor heavily rely on. More, uh, more importantly, uh, in regards to my presentation, though, I wanted to focus on how manual labor is uh, heavily attributed to the working class, and Mental labor, meanwhile, is heavily attributed to the classes ranked above the working class. So whether that's the middle class or the upper classes, they usually uh, are involved in more work that requires that uh, or that uses mental labor. And then finally, I wanted to just quickly touch upon the whole theory of meritocracies. So basically, this is just an idea of a government system in which power is specifically distributed to people based on their ability. So in other words, if someone is if someone can work the most effectively at a particular uh, job, they are going to get the uh, most power and most rewards within that job. But then, if you apply that to a government level, a government level, the uh, individuals who who are usually just most uh, are just most effective at their work are going to just sub are just going to subsequently receive that the uh, privileges of having that power. All right, so now I'm going to go back. Now I'm going on to uh, Paul Willis's observations and results. So the methodology that Paul Willis followed uh, in his uh, study is that he observed a clique of 12 boys at a secondary school in England, where and um, this specific clique was just, they always would refer to themselves as lads, and that's how Paul Willis also referred to themselves. And a huge thing that the lads exhibited was a whole vibe that just kind of screamed counter school culture. And what I mean by that is that uh, they uh, showed anti-authoritative anti uh, attitudes. They also showed misogyny and racism. I apologize why, I don't know why racism, I don't know how I left out racism, but racism should be next to that. It's, my, it's misogyny and racism. Um, I also have listed amusement, and what I mean by amusement is just in, 
in, in essence, just kind of sort of living life to the fullest without a care of of the repercussions when it comes to school. Like just if you picture someone just cutting class and having just going to a party and such, that's just doing that for like amusement. That's what I mainly refer to with that bullet. And then lastly, there's also a very uh, extreme disdain toward uh, between between the uh, lads toward their peers, and the lads specifically refer to these peers who are really uh, in 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 basic terms just those who uh, actually uh, took education a lot more seriously and followed all their teachers' instructions. They always refer to them as earls, and what that uh, terms and how that term gets derived is just because, and, and uh, as uh, Paul Willis wrote, the ear is actually one of the the uh, least uh, motorized organs, I believe, or just body parts in general. And just how um, and then just and the, and then the other part would be in the the olds is just kind of how fully conforming the uh, the ear olds, uh, for lack of a better word, are just. In regards to their teachers, they just conform to everything they listen to. They do exactly as described. It's just full of ears. In other, in the that's just the best way I can put it. But that's how they always referred to their peers that weren't part of their clique. And then, finally, as I had previously mentioned, the lads both they not only prioritized it, but they also valued manual labor a lot more than mental labor. They viewed manual labor as as something that's much more important, and they viewed it as something that was also uh, much more applicable to their lives, and they also viewed it as something that was uh, just another, and just, in essence, just had more uh, value to uh, being part of. So, um, if you notice, I had uh, numbers next to my four bullet points of, as, as to what the uh, feelings of the lads had, so... Number one was about their uh, anti-authority attitudes, and so a quote I pulled out from from that was one of the um, lads uh, exclaiming, "Teachers think they are everybody. They are more. They are higher than us, but they think they are a lot higher, and they're not. They think they're God." So then, uh, the next bullet point, which referred to uh, misogyny. This another lad was was overheard saying, "I was at a party snogging this bird." I'm not going to go into the details of that because we don't need to. But she stopped me. That's funny. Hers racking me off, but won't let me get down. Uh, and to be clear, the uh, contraction of hers is essentially, if you replace that with she's, it makes more grammatical sense. But that's just I'm just directly quoting the specific lad. So um, I'm pretty sure that qu quote can give you a pretty, uh, that might give you a rather disturbing image. And, but that's just, but it's also just a really, uh, a really overt quote that just captures their whole mentalities. So then uh, moving on to amusement, we had another lad who said, what's the opposite of boredom? Excitement. But what's excitement? Defying the law, breaking the law, like drinking, thieving, going down the streets, vandalizing, and so forth. And then, finally, I pulled out another uh, quote from a lad that that uh, clearly demonstrated their uh, hate toward the Earls. And this lad had said, why not be like the Earls? They don't get any fun, do they? Because them frats... <laughs> Like one kid, he's got five A's and one B. I mean, what will they remember of their school life? What will they have to look back on? Sitting in a classroom and sweating their bollocks off? So, um, again, this is just the language that the lads used. Um, and I think that kind of clearly gives an image as to what sort of, uh, types of people they've, they were and... And just, in my opinion, I, I think most people can agree, we probably wouldn't want to be around these types of people who act like this. That's just, at least if if you if there was one thing that just that just stuck stood out to me the most after reading this, it's just that these don't they don't really sound like nice people. 
So, uh, in the interest of moving on with some analysis, we uh, can clearly see how the lads prominently exhibited non-conforming views and just the and just a whole sense of rebellion towards those who quote unquote ranked above them. So what what so but specifically what the lads had realized is actually uh, meritocracy would be impossible under the current socioeconomic conditions in England. And once they had recognized this, they Paul Willis argues that the lads were inclining themselves in the direction of manual labor and the working class lifestyle just from the fact that they, they've accepted that they're always going to be toward that bottom echelon in a social hierarchy. So in other words, uh, Paul Willis's argument is that a school environment, in a sense, can implicitly redirect a student's future career path. When you think about it, it's just those who follow that, follow different paths of education are going to always just end up in a different career path. But then as, if you're in a school, if you're in an environment as toxic and as harsh as the one that the lads were in, you're just going to be just preparing yourselves to be at that low lowest part in society. So, so to wrap it all up, I wanted to uh, go over some discussion questions based on what I have talked about for the past uh, 12 minutes. So, my three questions are, number one, what action do you think would be the most appropriate for a teacher to take in the event of disciplining a student who expresses the same appalling attitudes as the lads? What, what would be the best way to handle their behavior, in other words? Number two, how do you think teachers can reform primary education so that they can rather diminish the existence of such counter school culture within secondary schools? How can they be proactive about this? And then finally, in terms of a much more uh, bigger picture, what impact do you think the reform that you came up with for question number two would have uh, on the working class as a whole? Do you think um, if do you think if the reform kind of decreased the amount of people who were headed toward working class jobs, do you think that would, how, like how much of an impact do you think that would have in the existence of the functioning working class within our economy? So since I'm doing this presentation just virtually, I'm going to skip over to my activity. So what I want, what I would have wanted everyone to do is to is to sketch a picture of what they believe what a, a meritocratic society looks like. It can, I know it's a rather uh, broad term to, to uh, sort of illustrate, but if you can perhaps just draw any elements that you can, that, that would be in whatever you visualize as a meritocratic society, I would like you to do that. And once you are done, once you are complete with your drawing, I want you to take a look at it and see if you can recognize any elements inside your drawing that parallel elements that are in American society today. On the converse, I would also I'd like you to uh, determine how um, accurately your your uh, draw your picture of a meritocratic society uh, represents American society. And it doesn't have to be, and it doesn't have to be accurate at all. The goal is to, the goal of my activity, I want, I want you to sketch meritocratic society, not American society. Whether that's the same or not, I leave that up to you. But once you are finished drawing your meritocratic society, how, how, uh, how accurate is that a depiction of American society? Does your drawing represent a society significantly different from American society? Or does your drawing rather uh, mirror what our American society looks like? All right, so again, since this is virtual and not in person, I'm going to be uh, sk skipping the time again, and I will just move on. And really, that's actually everything I have. Uh, these are my references, the top sources for uh, the author background and the book background, and then the bottom source is uh, the book Learning to Labor itself. All right, so 
Thank you very much for listening to my presentation.